Hello, this is my final video for going over the notes of the uh, lectures I've given over the last few weeks. Um, the first week we talked a lot about AFL, uh, American Fuzzy Lop. Second week we went into Hong Fuzz and Lib Fuzzer and sort of how it was different. You know, we talked about uh, compiling with code, whereas AFL was sort of more seen of a hacker's tool. Even though you can still compile, you can emulate easier on AFL, whereas things like Lib Fuzzer are more built for sort of continuous integration continuous development type sort of scenarios whereas i said hong fuzz very much sort of seems in the middle to that in uh, entire entire sort of sort of process is probably the best way to put it anyway last week we spoke a lot about the sanitizers and sort of the strategies for fuzzing went into a bit about how I like to attack programs first without sanitizers enabled to find the big bugs, the big drastic ones. Then finally, I will compile the sanitizers and then recompile with sanitizers if I've got access to the source code and then go and attack the uh, go and attack the source code. The source code that way and go and attack the binaries that way to find the smaller bugs. Well, this week we're going to talk about what like to describe as emulation and emulated base fuzzing. So, first things first, I spoke about what what emulation sort of, or where emulation came from. So emulation simply means you're trying to, you have a system, right, and, and you want that system to act as another system. And that's basically to emulate the other system, right? You have a system and you want it to act in a similar fashion to another system. So that's where sort of emulation came from. To do with specifically what we're talking about here, when we talk about systems, we talk about you know one instruction set acting or running a different type of instruction set is probably the best way to put it. Now, one of the things I sort of started going into was thinking about like I mean this is a basic way to think about stuff. So you know you've seen processors before. Processors have you know the those little squares right and if you turn the process over processor over you've got a bunch of sort of pins that stick up little gold pins or silver pins or whatever it is that stick up out the top now what a processor does is it's a really basic well i wouldn't say it's a basic device but it's a dumb device in that setting like it doesn't really do anything clever without the actual program code so the way you sort of if you think in a very rudimentary based way is that you would have these pins let's say this square here represents an intel processor and you have these pins on the bottom. Now, I can power up these pins in specific orders, right? Let's say the input power, I attach some wires, and I attach wires to these um, four red pins here. And when I, you know, power up those pins to whatever, you know, I'm supposed to power them up to, uh, it produces these, this at least this response here, which is these two green pins get lit up with voltages. Now, You've got clock speeds and you've got other things in the processor that can, you know, complicate this. I'm trying to make it more simple, uh, more complicated. I'm trying to make it simplified to be what it actually is. But, you know, in, in a really basic setting, if you apply these voltage levels to these pins, there's a chance that for a fraction of a second, at least when it's during a clock cycle, it could mean something and it could operate within some sort of state machine. And this is how you very much got to look at processors because this is all they're really doing is that you've got pins in some way and you're just applying voltages to these pins in a very specific order that means something to the processor in a certain way. And the processor's got a bunch of circuits and gates in here that recognises, for instance, when you light up these four pins with power, that it's going to produce these two pins. So the way that we can actually describe this in a really fundamental way is what i sort of drawn on the left here. So we have these ideas of addition and subtraction I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what they mean and oh shit and we also have this idea of what's called the comparison so the cmp you know operation as you compare it you know one add two is that equal to two or or is that equal to three right and you know if you compare you know the number three with another number three that's coming in you know it can return true or false so this comparison just says it's yes or no right does this number here, the number three, equal this number th over here, the number three? If it does, fine. You know, if this number is actually number four, does it equal number three? No, it doesn't. So perform a different action. And, you know, you've got all of these sort of types of things that this processor can can do. Remember, this processor is just some sort of 
you know, almost a dumb square that you have to give voltage levels to. And, you know, if I give these specific voltage levels to it, it could represent, a, you know, a CMP, it could represent a subtraction operation, it could represent an addition operation. Um, so the way we represent these, or the way it's actually represented, so it's like sort of to the processor at the basic level, is just basic bit streams of data. So these, these bit streams here mean something let's pick intel these things here mean something particular to intel right so if i send if i send 0110 which might be the case here so let's say this is zero because there's no power this means one because there's power one and then zero right no power zero one zero zero well if i let's say excite these pins in this order the next line zero one zero zero that might mean subtract you know in the third setting we have zero zero one zero in this case it could mean add so we're basically applying, you know, voltages to these chips in certain ways. And the way we apply them and the meaning that we have to these bit patterns that we send into it in some, you know, way that's far abstracted away from us, you know, it represents some underlying instruction. So we have adds, you know, we, we say we want to add this number, we want to add this number. And it turns out that, you know, when these two pins get lit up in some order or when they get clocked back out to us by the processor, it's going to return the result. So, you know, I can set up this instruction and say, let's do an add instruction, then send in two values, say one and one, and then it might return, you know, two back out of the processor. And the exact way and what these bit patterns mean and what they stand for is what's called an instruction set architecture ISA. So I've written it down here, so you've got ISA. So instruction set architecture, right? And that's basically what it is. And the other thing is to sort of note is that you've got things like ARM processors, MIPS processors, PowerPC processors. And, and the only difference really between these two, th all these different instructions or instruction sets is, you know, they have different meanings for the comparisons and, you know, they've got different sort of complexities for doing certain things faster or slower and the power usage. And, and, and very much when it comes to sort of processors, they're all, they're all basically Turing machines. There's this notion of... A, you know, let's say you've got some machine that can process everything that can be processed. You know, there are some things that inherently can't be processed by, you know, a Turing machine. But we have some theoretical machine that could process everything that is theoretically possible to process. You know, if you build another machine, or let's call this first machine, let's call it an Intel processor. If you build another machine, it doesn't have to look exactly the same in any way. But we could call it, you know, an ARM machine, or we could build another one and call it a power PC machine. But fundamentally, all of these things can do no better than a Turing machine. Now, the difference between a 1960s monolithic computer and an Intel processor isn't in its capabilities in terms of what it can or can't process, given enough time and space. Its, its difference is, you know, how quickly it can perform those instructions or how much power it actually uses to perform those instructions so this is what you sort of need to realize between different instruction sets is they have uh, and i've written them all down here they, or some of them down here they have fundamental differences in how easy they are to perform certain tasks how quick they execute certain tasks or how much power they save a really classic example is intel processors at least traditionally haven't been very good for power usage They've been incredibly fast, but they've not been very good for power usage. Whereas ARM processors may have been slower historically, but they're good for power usage. So you might use Intel in some sort of you know really big data center server, whereas you might use an ARM processor because it saves more power in a mobile device. And that's one of the reasons why we see them in mobile devices and embedded devices. It's like the way they've been designed is inherently for power usage. Now it sort of gets a bit merged and muddled these days, but this is essentially what they do. So you've got this idea of you know instruction set architectures. You've got physical processors that have these instructions that get sent into the processors that mean a particular thing, and you know there's just a big list of instructions and what they mean and what bits of data actually get sent to the processor. And that's fundamentally what makes up an instruction, or sorry, yeah, a, an instruction set architecture. And one way that we actually represent these in programs, and this is all programs are right. You know, you've got some sort of source code, let's say some source, just say some source code file here, right? And you've got like some compiler in the middle. And this source code file, you know, you compile this and out pops a binary. I did originally draw bin here, you may be able to see it, but that's what it says, bin for binary. 
Now, what this binary is, really, is just a bunch of instructions in a specific order. So when you execute this binary, the computer knows to load it up into memory, and when it loads it up into memory, it starts at the first, you know, the first instruction, once that's finished executing the second, then the third, then the fourth, and goes all the way until it exits at a certain point, or it continues forever in an infinite loop. Those are the two things that your processor could do. It can go on forever, or it can halt. You know, hopefully, if we're fuzzing stuff, we're looking for crashes, but this is the sort of idea. You know, processors have this notion of instruction set architectures, of what these things and bit patterns mean, you know, based on whether or not it's an Intel processor or an ARM processor, as I've sort of detailed here, will dictate what instructions actually get here. And you remember, these things have different bit patterns. They may, they all have, like, the ability to add and subtract and compare, right? And they may even be called exactly the same. It may be just called add, compare, or subtract. But the bit patterns are pretty much likely, if not guaranteed to be different. I've not checked this in every single architecture. And, you know, fundamentally, you know, how this is wired and how it performs an addition operation can be completely different, you know, on depending on the architecture. But I don't really care. All I care is that if I give it two things and it goes away and adds them, I don't care how it's done it. And that's sort of a big fundamental difference between the different architectures and whether or not they you know, perform certain operations quicker or whether or not they actually save power while doing it. So I wanted to make that sort of notion that you've got this idea of different architectures. So originally with emulation, what you may have wanted to do is a really good use case is say you're a, you know, ARM developer, right? You want to go and develop some sort of ARM application or an iOS application. However, you may not have a ARM board or a ARM processor to be able to actually run the instructions. And the one thing I need to say is these instructions, as I represented on the other piece of paper, those instructions can only ever run for the type of architecture that they run on, right? So an ARM, process, an ARM binary, as I drew before, let's say here, this ARM binary can only ever run on an ARM binary. It can't run on an Intel binary. Just ignore this bit here for the moment. So you have this sort of issue where you can be a developer that's either trying to emulate a different system or run a different binary, but you can't actually run any of the software you're building. And there's also two notions with uh, building software. So you've got the, or, or emulating software, should I say. The first one is, you know, you've got to, if I'm on an Intel processor, right, and I'm a developer on a laptop, probably not going to be an ARM laptop. Pretty sure I'm going to guarantee it's not going to be. And I'm going to have some sort of, you know, development environment here and I'm going to be writing source code and this source code is going to get compiled down to a binary however you know the binary isn't going to be something we can run how, how many times have people ever like wrote source code or run a python file and gone oh actually I can't run python files on this you know this computer because it's the wrong architecture or you know I can't compile I can't run this thing here because you know I've compiled on a different architecture now it's, it's not a very common thing to do unless you do what's called cross compilation and that's the idea that you have source code on a particular machine let's say an intel machine and then you write binaries or sorry you write the source code and it gets compiled to binaries that aren't on your native architecture now it becomes a bit arbitrary when i says cross compilation because you know there's no reason why you always have to write you know there's no reason that you have to ever produce software binaries for the particular you know system you're on but traditionally you know we do so when we install gcc which is more complicated than just for intel processors we have this notion that we can actually do it for many many different processors and i'll just give a, a very quick demonstration of this if i just switch over to my virtual machine uh, let's wait for it to load to load there we go let's just write a uh, I'm just going to remove QMU ah that's not what I need to um, bin temp uh, .hc. let's just write a quick c file uh, c9h So, right, it's just uh, CD. I've just written a very quick uh, hello file. Um, so, out.c. Uh, just compile it. Um, I'm going to compile the out.c file. 
I'm going to compile it, uh, send it to the out binary. So if we look at the out binary, you can see it, x86, 64. And, you know, if I run it out, you know, it does what we expect it to. However, I've pre-installed a software, a bunch of what I call, is it called a, a tool chain, which is all the, soft, all the software binary packages required to actually build software. And that's if I let's pick I know, ARMS, for instance. So ARM Linux, uh, GNUE ABI, um, and we want GCC, right? As you can see here, there is an actual GCC. When you actually use GCC on the command line, what it actually should be is x86-64 Linux GNUE API GCC. But, you know, because it's our native system, with the shorthand is just to call it GCC, just to make it simpler. So, you know, this has exactly the same files that we can run, so or does exactly the same thing, and we're just going to run it to a.out file. Again, so we've overwritten the out file, so let's just have a look at that. However, this time, whereas you saw as the previous one, if I go back, it said x86-64, right? Well, there's this one now says ARM. I'm doing this little trick, otherwise uh, QM you'll catch it, and I'll explain that in a bit. But I'm going to I'm going to say I'm going to run this as a x86-64 binary, you know, this out, and it says invalid elf image for this architecture, which makes sense because I'm trying to, you know, run it as an x86-64 binary. However using this thing called QMU that I will talk about in a second, if I use ARM and then run, you know, run the file again, I, it, it actually pr prints out, oh, sorry, it prints the uh, output, which is hello, which is really, really useful, right? So this is an actual an actual emulator. So I just wanted to show you that quickly. If you want to install these packages, install, I believe, a GCC, ARM, Linux, GNUE, ABI. Uh, so that is, if you install this, this will have... It will install the entire tool chain that you saw me using. Uh, can't spell fuzz. So it's you know it's already installed on my system, but if you wanted to install it, it would be GCC ARM Linux GNUE ABI. But when you call it, you'd actually call it as uh, ARM. So so like this. So you know it's a bit different. So the Linux is the ARM is switched over and the GCC this time is at the end. So just make sure that you have that differentiation, but these are essentially the same things when installing them. However, the install package will also install all the other stuff like the assemblers and the loaders and the linkers for me, uh, just to sort of make, just to make, just to show you that you can cross compile. So, you know, I'm building a tool chain here, which is going to cross compile the source code. So when I, you know, did the, come up, um, Oh God, never mind. But when I built the software before, it was actually cross compiling it for the ARM architecture. Whereas this, we're actually installing it as the ARM architecture. Uh, sorry, the, the cross the cross compiler. So if I just switch back to my desk. Cool. So I've said about this notion that, you know, we have Intel processors on the right hand side and we have, you know, an ARM binary on the left hand side. But the problem is that you know, we can't run an ARM binary on Intel processor, as I've demonstrated with that version of QMU. But what can you do is you can have this thing that translates in the middle. So I spoke about before that, you know, every machine essentially does the same as every other machine. And that is that, you know, an Intel processor can perform no more operations, theoretically speaking, than an ARM processor. It just different, dif dif differentiates between how quick it can perform certain actions and how much power it uses. But the one thing that one thing that means is that we can always represent in a different, you know, a different instruction set. We can always represent the instructions we need to execute, you know, as an Intel set of instructions or a set of ARM instructions. Now that doesn't mean there is always a one-to-one -one comparison for really basic stuff like, you know, if you have a, a addition operation on the right and an addition operation on the left. Remember, the left is ARM, the right is Intel. Is that you know when it sees an an addition operation as it can do a trans a straight one-to-one -one transfer or translate of that operation because you know all that's happening in this case is the intel is reading this first instruction right and it's going oh you know i understand what that means that's an addition operation and then it comes to the right and it does this one-to-one -one comparison over here and says oh i understand what addition is that's easy it's a very simple thing however you know let's say for more complicated instructions 
and I know this is the case, there's no there's no such thing as a return instruction on ARM. There's a there's a notion of something similar with you know branch link registers, or, or uh, BLR registers, or you know when you actually return from a, a a a process or you return from a stack frame. But there's no actually there's no real understanding of what this return instruction means. But you can represent it as a set of instructions in ARM. So as an Intel, you might have one single ret instruction in ARM. You may need to take three instructions. Right. So even though this Intel processor can perform one thing, you know, perform it in a single atomic operation on the left hand side, ARM doesn't have that luxury. So it must use three different instructions to perform it, which is a bit annoying. So we have this idea of translation, you know, back and forth. Remember, this is in software at the moment. You have this thing where we're back and forth. We want to run an ARM binary on an Intel or an Intel on ARM binary. We have this thing in the middle called QMU, which does the translation. However, that translation isn't always one to one, but it is the notion of it can do everything this processor can do, everything that processor can do, and that processor can do everything this processor can do is definitely something that is entirely possible. But it doesn't necessarily need to have a one to one comparison, whereas a subtraction or addition might, a return probably won't. And again, for more complex instructions. Oh, cool. Let me just find my other sheet. Cool. Excellent. Let's back. So, in QMU specifically, as I said, it does this translation thing. The bit that does the translation is what's called the Tiny Code Generator, or TCG for short. And this does that thing where it says it, you know, it, it takes a few Intel or a single Intel instructions. And, you know, it can translate it to ARM or whatever. However, in this circumstance, what we're going to do is instead of running an Intel instruction directly on an Intel processor, you know, as is the case with a virtual machine, sort of, is we're going to run the Intel process, the Intel binary, but we're going to run it through an, you know, QMU Intel instance and to the CPU. Now, what this is going to give us the ability to do is that whenever there's a code block that gets executed, and I'll demonstrate that really quickly, I mean, it, oops, wrong one. It doesn't really make much sense. However, if I just recompile this binary to make it Intel, so again, we can, you know, we can actually run it. So x86, x64 again, we can run it. That's what our system is. However, I can also, you know, run it under the x, QMU x86, 64, which seems a bit pointless apart from it's probably going to run a bit slower because we're emulating it and some of it's going to have to be in software at least. I'll explain that in a little bit. But the really nice thing that this allows us to do is because it's going through this notion of doing the translation, we can debug we can debug the actual oops, let uh, me just redirect that because it's a bit annoying. So we have this notion that we can actually trace the instructions as they're getting executed, right? So as we can do this really quickly and just show a demonstration. So if I look for, if I just do read elf on that binary, we can see that the entry point address is 1060. We're going to look for that in the execution stream when we run it. So, you know, this is what this means. We're going to run this, this program under QMU, but we're going to debug it and tell it, and it's going to tell us every time it hits a new uh, code block and it gets actual execute in the underlying system. So we're going to look for this. And here we go. This here in the symbol start, because that was the main, that was the first entry point within that binary we looked at in read elf, was actually the start symbol, which means at this point, we know that this is where the, the binary actually starts executing from. It's got a bit of guff at the start, which is going to be, you know, within the QMU process itself, doing a lot of setting stuff up. But we can actually hit the underlying pro process here in the underlying binary and execute it. And really importantly here is this is a memory address of the code we're executing. And this is the memory address of the code we're executing. So this is your instruction pointer as it's executing, which means that we can actually trace the addresses of the different blocks as they get executed in memory, which means we can actually record the traces for these as they go through the processor and we can actually know 
where it's going, which means we can do that nice instrumented bit of fuzzing that we like to do. However, there's another bit of sort of uh, in between that I need to talk about, which is called um, KVM or Kernel Virtual Machine and Intel VTX, the, 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 the instructions that allow it to do support emulation where the instead of if you're running an intel on an intel cpu for instance i mean why why do you have to go to this middle bit of software and do this translation it's very 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 slow so this kvm plugin came along and you know different ones on windows and hyper v and stuff is it doesn't actually execute it just executes the instructions directly on the cpu at which point you go well you know is it emulation anymore because you're not actually emulating a system, you're just virtualizing and you're running stuff directly, you know, from an Intel binary to run on an Intel CPU, and you've got this idea of this just passed through. However, Intel has a bunch of uh, virtualization technologies, Intel VTX, that sort of like put a little container around these this bits of code and like to sandbox them. But I just wanted to make the point that you can actually trace the code with QMU, like I did with the debugger there, and you can actually figure out if I introduce some sort of uh, uh, data into this process or this program here at the top, this might perform a different set of actions. And as I've demonstrated there, we can trace those actions, which is very, very, very useful to us. Uh, let me just have a look. Cool. But we can also, you know, build stuff with AFL and we can actually run it. Uh, with, under the emulator, sorry, without building it in AFL, we can actually run it under an emulator, which is really nice because we might not always have access to the source code. We might not have always access to the uh, all the binaries that we might want to. We might not have access to the underlying system, as is the case with you know an IoT device. You know, it might be on an ARM machine, but we actually want to do the fuzzing on an Intel box. Or, you know, you're not going to go build an operating system and buy a power PC board just to be able to do some fuzzing. It would be quicker, but you're probably not going to do it. There's a lot more issues there. What you can do is you can pull out these individual binaries and actually run code on them. Sorry, you can actually emulate them, you know, with an AFL and you can actually run stuff, which is really, really, really useful. So do I have anything else to talk about? Um, so uh, not particularly, sort of just more going over the same. Uh, really. However, there's just one sort of quick thing I wanted to note. When we did this print f function here, you know, even though we were translating the underlying code, which was you know addition operation, subtraction operations, we also need to you know call into my monitor at some point, right? Because that's a physical bit of hardware that you know my computer uses. But that monitor is specific. You know, it's the hardware is specific to me and my machine and my you know the actual operating system running it. So the R, and the, here's another thing. So what happens is when you run these binaries and it calls printf, which is what we, we typed out before, is it needs to go down the user space area where we're sitting in our process, down to the operating system, you know, down to the kernel, which interacts with the hardware and outputs it to my monitor here. So essentially we're going down here and actually printing this thing on the monitor. But the problem is, is that it does this via, you know, what's called syscalls or ioctals in some way, which is a syscall, right? It does it via a system call to tell the kernel to go and print something to a monitor. But these syscalls are very dependent on the underlying operating system. And the architecture specifically, they get set up in different ways, which means not only do we have to do the normal translation of, you know, instructions from subtraction on an ARM processor to a subtraction instruction on an Intel processor, we also need to translate these syscalls. So QMU sort of does two things. It does this, you know, like I said, translation of the uh, actual instructions themselves, and it does this syscall translation. And this syscall translation and the system, this actual system translation, is what allows things like VirtualBox, Hyper-V, VMware to exist, because we, we can actually isolate and I would almost say contain a virtual machine running in a certain environment, and then we can translate you know, this syscall type, which is also dependent on Linux, and we can translate it to a Windows syscall, right? So it's not just about you know running stuff as an Intel operation or an ARM on an ARM operation. We can also translate these syscalls, which are you know based on a Linux system that I was just showing you, and we can run it on a Windows system. And that's exactly what I'm doing right now. Is my machine, my virtual machine, is actually running on a Windows box, 
you know, Windows hardware, sorry, not Windows hardware, Windows operating system on my actual laptop itself. Um, I think that just goes over all the notes I wanted to talk about. Uh, I did have this slide, but it just sort of talks more about the same thing as the idea of, a, you know, you've got your Intel processor on the right hand side, you've got your ARM binary on the left hand side, and when you install the tool chain, as I showed you before with GCC, it's going to, you know, it's going to get that compiler, compiler GCC, but it's also going to get a linker in there specific to an ARM processor, sorry, ARM binary and ARM architecture, and it's also going to get assembly because an assembly actually works as part of a compiler. Um, anyway, I think that's all of my notes done. And anyway, it's been great teaching you guys. Fantastic. Sorry if I took a bit of time to get these things out. Uh, they do take quite a lot of time up in my day. But it's been great teaching you, been great speaking with you, and I hope you guys can stick around for more courses in the future. I plan on running one about IoT devices and IoT pen testing, talk about the new standards and the new laws that are governing IoT security in the United Kingdom specifically, and other such things like you know 5G hacking, if anyone's particularly interested in that, or you know automotive hacking, mobile application hacking, all that nice stuff. About the only thing I don't do really is Windows hacking. I just do all this other, all the other really difficult stuff that I find really fun, and I just tend to leave Windows to you know <laughs> people that are more skilled at it than me, and I've just basically never got into it or you know never really fancied it. But you know if you want to learn about all that other juicy stuff, you know IoT embedded stuff, ICS testing. Uh, you know, operational technology, industrial stuff, attacking cars, attacking satellites, hitting the 5G, 4G systems, fixed line systems, you know, more than happy to talk about it. And even web applications and mobile applications if people are willing to listen.